With new hardware announced weekly, it's not uncommon for PC builds to become obsolete several months after the release date due to fluctuations in prices. New technology that was once overpriced is now much more affordable months down the line. It's simple common sense, and it's ignorant to assume otherwise. That said, last time I made a $1,000 build was 9 months ago, and it's not uncommon for people to spend that much either, especially at this time of the year. Here's an epic smallish PC, or a portable one, that will play games very nicely at 1440p, and to an extent 4K. Hey what's up guys, Scarce here, and today we're going to be going over an insane $1,000 PC. As you'd expect, this PC won't have a problem playing at 1440p, way above 60fps, and pretty much all games, and even 4K60 if you're willing to turn some settings down to high and turn off anti-aliasing. Not as if that's actually going to be useful at 4K. Not only that, but it's also extremely portable compared to the false stigma and association of the size of PC towers. This build won't come with a mouse and keyboard though, nor a monitor, and nor the OS. Anyway, I've kept you waiting for long enough, here's the build. So for the CPU of the Intel Core i5 6500 3.2GHz quad-core processor, costing $196. For the money, this CPU is great, it's about $100 cheaper than the i7-6700, and still performs very similar in games. I could have gone with a 6700, but it would respect other things such as the GPU, or the case, PSU, all of those things basically put together. Gaming utilizes the GPU much more than the CPU, and although you do get hyper-threading with the i7, it will only marginally boost FPS, and for the price, those couple of extra frames really aren't worth it. And i7s aren't really intended to perform better at gaming. This CPU is a quad-core, meaning that it has four cores, running at a base clock of 3.2GHz and a boost of 3.6GHz. This is more than enough for gaming. The CPU won't bottleneck the GPU, so there's no problem there, and also the fact that it has got four cores would definitely help you out in your streaming or rendering, compared to say an i3 with hyper-threading, or a Pentium, quite obviously. Unfortunately, overclocking isn't going to be an option on this due to both the CPU and motherboard combo. One awesome thing about the CPU is the architecture and socket it uses. So because it's on the LG1150 on socket, it means that you won't have a problem upgrading the CPU to a Skylake or KB Lake i7 if you decide that you want to get more into heavy video editing and streaming and reckon that the i5 is no longer sufficient. This will prevent you from having to buy another motherboard or choose a different socket, when in years you might have a discussion about upgrading. For the CPU cooler, we have the Cryorig M9i 48.4 CFM CPU cooler costing 20 bucks. I know exactly what you're thinking right now. Why bother wasting money on a CPU cooler if you're not overclocking? Yes, you're right, we can use a stock cooler that comes with a CPU, but there's three main reasons why we're not going with this. Aesthetics, temp, and noise. Seeing a crappy stock cooler sucks visually, especially after taking a lot of pride in a build like this, and especially at this price range. Temps on this are also a lot lower, meaning you are going to be getting a cooler CPU, which will allow it to turbo more consistently. The temps of the CPU will drop down and stay low during gaming, and going with a CPU cooler like this means that it will also be considerably quieter, since you can turn down the RPM of the fan and still have a push a lot of air. Ta-da! For the motherboard, I want the ASRock H110M ITX AC Mini ITX LG Lift with your motherboard, costing $68. For the price, you're getting a lot of features since this motherboard does come with a dual-band Wi-Fi module, supporting both 2.4 and 5 GHz channels, with wireless connections topping out at 433 megabits per second, most likely above your broadband plan. This does also complement the build much nicer, and that you can take the system to different places and connect to the internet without having to have it hardwired. So, hotspots for the win, I guess. Mini ITX boards such as this one are generally limited in upgradeability, but personally, I think the smaller system is worth it. The only thing you're really missing out on is multiple GPU support, which the majority of people don't even give a damn about because of the inconsistent scaling in games. The board supports 4 SATA 6 per second ports, allowing you to connect up to 4 drives, and has USB 3.0 headers. They're a standard in today's hardware. It has support for 2 memory modules with a max speed of 2133MHz, XMP isn't supported though. In terms of back panel, you get 1 PS2 port, 4 USB 2.0 ports, and 2 USB 3.0 ports, as well as an RJ45 LAN port, audio ports, and some display connectors, which really don't matter since you are going to be connecting your monitors to the GPU, and not the motherboard. Not only is this one of the cheapest Mini ITX boards, but due to the nature of its features, you're also getting a considerable amount of value here. For RAM, we have the Corsair Vengeance LPX 16GB 2GB DDR4 2133 memory, costing $74. Stylish heat spreaders make us a worthy contester against any other similarly priced module for your money, since many other ones either look like shit or they're much more expensive for the same performance. Red aesthetics do complement your build, though you won't actually be seeing them because we don't have a windowed side panel, but it does still complement the pronounced hint of red. 
Unfortunately, going with two modules fills both the RAM slots, and so you can't upgrade to a larger RAM capacity unless you actually replace them. That said, 8GB is plenty for games, and the extra amount, because we are using 16, will help you out if you're looking to make RAM discs, edit, or do intensive simulations or renders. For storage, we have both an SSD and a hard drive. Starting with the SSD, we have the SanDisk SSD Plus 240GB 2.5 and solid state drive, costing $63. SSDs are much faster than hard drives, with a compromise of capacity for the same price. 24 gigs is enough for installing Windows, your programs, and a couple of AAA titles. In my case, I loaded Battlefield onto an SSD, and oh my god, the difference is astonishing. It saw decreased boot times and loading times though, not FPS, but a 240GB SSD is perfect capacity for an SSD. This is because cost per gigabyte is much lower for a 240GB SSD compared to both a 120 and a 480GB SSD. For the hard drive, we went with the Western Digital Caviar Blue 1TB 3.5-7200 RPM internal hard drive, costing $50. This will be your mass storage solution for the rest of all your games, all over videos, music, and other files as well. A combo of an SSD and a HD will save you a lot of money and still provide a good blend between speed and capacity. Now for the GPU, I want the EVGA GeForce GTX 1070 8GB for the One Gaming ACX 3.0 video card, costing $405. Most people understand relative performance much more than statistical analysis because that does tend to change over time, but also because it's much easier to understand anime predictions and performance, but I will still leave objective statistical performance of this card in the description below. This card performs slightly better than the 980Ti in most situations, even when that card is overclocked. Generally though, you'll see both cards trading blows, and the difference isn't actually that big, until you compare the better memory compression and the 2 extra gigs of VRAM. Currently, this is better than anything AMD offers, at the moment at least, but that might change with the release of the RX 490. Though we'll just have to wait in seasons, that will come out in several months. But this is a great card, and won't have a problem playing a 1080p Ultra at 144fps, 1440p a frame rate that's still much higher than 60, and 4K at around 30fps in a lot of titles on Ultra. Jack some of those settings down to high and you won't have a problem reaching 60. Core clock of this GPU is 1510 MHz, which you should be able to easily overclock, resulting in higher FPS at the expense of creating more heat. Generally, smaller builds do have a problem keeping temps low, or at least low enough to be considered comfortable, but in this case, we went with one that doesn't actually suffer from the same issue. I'm regarding the case, not the GPU at the moment. This means that we don't actually have to go with a blower style card to prevent excessive heat buildup. This card has one HDMI, one DVI, and three displayable connections. And the two most popular features are probably CUDA and Shadowplay. CUDA will do the GPU acceleration with things like video editing, so the entire post production process will go a lot faster and smoother. Whereas Shadowplay, on the other hand, will allow you to record games on your PC. More on that in the card above in the top right hand corner of the screen. The 8GB frame buffer or VRAM would definitely prove useful when playing at high resolutions such as 1440p and 4K. Things like post processing effects and anti aliasing massively affect this. 8GB might still be overkill for now, but there's no reason to complain about it, since it is still a beneficial upgrade over the older generation consumer flagship cards. For the case of the Fantex N3 Evolve ITX Mini ITX tower case, costing $60. Great price for such a good quality case. This one unfortunately doesn't feature a windowed side panel, but it supports three internal 3.5 inch drives and one internal 2.5 inch drive, basically for things like standard hard drives and SSDs. After buying a system like this, you'll agree that we do want a system to look exceptional, and this is just one of the few options that really speaks out for itself. There is a Windows side panel version of this case with like red accents, it's pretty nice, for $10 more. I personally don't actually think that that model is going to be worth it, as the plexiglass itself scratches much more easily than the metal on this. This case is everything you could ask for for a mini ITX tower, with good cable management, ample room for storage, sturdy build, and even native custom water cooling support. It's a bit larger than a mini tower, though still a little smaller than a micro ITX build. And lastly, we have the EVGA BQ 750W H Plus Bronze Certified Semi Modular ATX Power Supply, which will do a nice job at $65. Not much to say about this other than it is semi modular, meaning that cable management will be much easier since you don't actually have to hide the cables you're not using. You just don't plug them in. Power connectors are sufficient too, so good shit. This PSU is very reliable, especially when compared to similar popular models at this price point. Anyway, I just want to give everyone a massive thanks for helping me reach 5k subs. An awesome achievement, and I can't wait to see what direction this channel goes. Though it will still be true to what you've come to expect. Hopefully entertaining videos that develop your understanding of tech and PC gaming. I'll be hosting some things later on in the year to celebrate that, though my current plans for uni entry exams and all the rest are prohibiting me from doing that. 
Thanks for watching. If you have enjoyed, smash that like button, share this build to help me reach a larger audience. The support I've received over the course of my channel has been absolutely inspiring. And you as an individual, thank you. This has been Proto. Adios. Back from the dead.